I'm joined by Jason Giorgiani, American philosopher, writer, former New Jersey Institute of Technology lecturer, former editor-in-chief of the European New Right publishing company, Arctis Media, and co-founder of what's called the Alt-Right Company with Richard Spencer. Um, so I'm, I want to ask you more about the Alt-Right Corporation, but uh, first we'll just mention the books because you're such a fascinating intellectual. Um, I've only had a chance to read uh, most of Iranian Leviathan at this point, uh, but I know I want to read your whole collection, including the new one, Closer Encounters. Uh, but you've written Prometheism, you've written, written Faustian Futurist, Prometheus and Atlantis, um, World State of Emergency, Lovers of Sophia. I mean, you're, you just, you are a true intellectual, and in these days, that's a dangerous thing because we're not allowed to be intellectuals and see things in a way of trying to get, you know, at a deeper understanding and, and look at things from different perspectives and angles. We are supposed to be just in this leftist, you know, sort of status communist box that's mostly oriented toward liberalism at this point. Uh, but essentially, if they can't put you into a box, then uh, they'll put a mask on you and uh, kick you out of <laughs> kick you off the university campus, right? If they can't inject you, you're not welcome at the university anymore. That says a lot. So um, let's talk about what it is to be alt right in your perspective. Well, at this point, I certainly would not identify myself with the alt right. Um, matter of fact, I don't think the alt-right exists anymore. I don't think the alt-right ever really existed as any kind of a coherent, uh, it, it didn't exist as a coherent ideology and it certainly did, did not exist as a cohesive organization. Um, and I would know because I was actually the person trying to create some kind of cohesive organization from out of it. And, uh, you know, what these people who defamed me in the New York Times and other mainstream media outlets uh, don't want to be known is that the reason that I brought together uh, several different organizations, Arctos Media, the publishing house, Red Ice Radio and Television, and then Richard Spencer's National Policy Institute under one umbrella in order to form the so-called Alt-Right Corporation, was so that we could take this incohate, uh, seething chaos that was the nascent alt-right and uh, move it away from the white nationalism that Richard ultimately allowed himself to become a caricature of uh, and move it towards some more constructive vision of uh, what I call uh, Indo-European civilizational values. So I had this vision in uh, 2016, in the fall of 2016, which ultimately was crystallized into my book, World State of Emergency in the summer of 2017. I had this vision of a global Indo-European alliance that would reconnect the West with its Aryan cousins in the East and not at all based on a racial conception. I envisioned Japan and the Buddhist countries as being part of this civilizational alliance that would stretch from the West through Iran into India and then connect up to Japan and Buddhist East Asia. And the idea was to you know, promote the most uh, humanistic, forward-oriented, industrious uh, ideals in human history and to build a bulwark against the hive-minded uh, mentality of communist China on the one hand and uh, degenerative materialistic capitalism in the West on the other hand. So that was the intention uh, you know, with which I brought these several organizations together and agreed to become Richard Spencer's business partner. And you know, I had been promised, I mean, we had been, but through me, uh, been promised a capital investment for forming this alt-right corporation. And this was coming from, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, and I'm, I'm you know, volunteering this information not for the first time. It, uh, it's actually been discussed in a book on Steve Bannon by Ben Tiedelbaum, um, I think called War for Eternity. There's about a dozen pages, maybe 20 pages about me in that book. And it tells this story in brief. So 
uh, I'm not in, you know, really revealing any information that hasn't already been put out there in the public sphere. The salvaged intelligence directorate of Blackwater, which had connections with certain individuals in the early Trump administration, offered a capital investment for the formation of this organization. And the idea was that I would ideologically reorient this potentially destructive white nationalist alt-right movement toward uh, the, the um, vision of a global Indo-European civilizational alliance. And the, for reasons that are complex uh, and uh, for reasons that are complex and about which I, I have a lot of doubts in terms of the excuses that were repeatedly given to me, uh, the funding never came through. And in fact, I'm left to wonder whether the whole thing wasn't sort of some kind of a setup in order to uh, suffocate this organization in its, in its cradle. Um, but in any case, the funding never came through. And between January of 2017, when the Alt-Right Corporation was formed, and Charlottesville in the summer of 2017, the whole thing was derailed. I lost control of my, my uh, partners and, and of the ideological orientation of the, the company. And it in effect became uh, exactly what I was trying to get the alt-right away from. Um, and Richard you know, basically got into this feedback loop of negative reinforcement through the media, where the more attention he got for being a poster child of white nationalism, the more he um, embraced that caricature of himself uh, to the point where ultimately I could no longer endorse the you know, activities of this organization and I resigned in protest. And then I was defamed. Exactly. Interestingly, not while I was part of the alt-right corporation, Afterward. but after I resigned within one month of my resignation. Exactly, exactly. And so does that make you suspect to the intention of some of the people or, yeah, certainly I would suggest some of the people that you were working with. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly say so, right? I mean, so there's an intention, it seems, see a lot of the stuff we talk about civilizational politics, you, you remind me of uh, Sam Huntington's work, right? And the clash of civilizations. And even though he was presumably, I guess, more Democrat, he was closer to Brzezinski and company, he really is what I consider New World Order Democrat. Uh, these people, when we talk of New World Order, that transcend party, pol party, this is not Republican and Democrat, this is, as you know, th this is globalists, people that basically want uh, co global corporations and essentially a globalized one world state as much as possible, uh, uh, globalization of, of finance and all these things to basically uh, better control people across, you know, across the planet. And so it's almost like there's been this interesting dialectic at work between uh, really since the, the days of national socialism, right? Of like, you know, where does the socialist and the, and the and fascist find common ground, right? Because presumably socialism is more state-based control, right? The state sort of... Uh, uh, controls your life to a certain extent uh, you know obviously there's a taxation system at work but um, whether it's medicine or uh, work and these kind of things the state is more in charge of that and then the fascist is really since Mussolini termed it corporatism I mean is it right fascism basically corp mass mass corporations in bed with the state it's not that much different when people really if you think about it it really is not that different ideologically whether or not the corporation is and look at what we're seeing now with this ma this uh, vaccination issue, right? So it's like, well, in America, the state can't really, they can mandate, I guess, to their employees to get vaccinated, but the state can't really tell everybody to get vaccinated. But then they're gonna, the state's going to work with the corporations to say, okay, well, everyone's going to get vaccinated that works for this, these big corporations. Wow. I mean, what is the difference at that point between fascism and, and, and socialism? It, ultimately, it is this massive state that is at work whether it's in bed with the corporations or not, I really, I don't think there is that much of a difference. And I think this has been a, a faulty illusion uh, perpetuated for a long time that, you know, these, uh, how do you say, that fascism and socialism are so contrary to each other. Um, really just the idea that fascism is more to do with uh, 
racism, right? That's always that's been the argument since the days of Nazism that it was some something based in racism. But Mussolini was not based in racial politics per se. He was a nationalist. Uh, so again, I don't. It's I guess you could say that the two extremes, fascism being more of a, a nationalist ideology in their point of view, the right the right fascists that are more pro-state but also happy to be in bed with the global corporations, and then the hardcore socialists that may not be as statist or you know they may be more statist but for the most part we look at it and they're more maybe transnational in terms of their approach you know we have to be part of the global order of you know uh whatever the un or the who or the you know you name it the the, whatever conventions that they want to now go to in fact one argument is that biden could go to the international criminal court for example and you know basically throw america into that and start to uh who knows, you know, charge American citizens under ICC rulings. I mean, it's a very warped lens. What the media has been putting out is this idea. I think my point is that the media is putting out this idea, not just media, intellectuals and others are perpetuating these ideas of left versus right. But if we really look at it, it's not as distinct. Yes, there are factions, but I would say, argue that ultimately the ideology of a massive state in bed with global corporations moving towards increased power of the state and the global corporations does not have a left or a right brand to it. I entirely agree with you. And just to flesh out what you were saying there, um, I would add that, uh, you know, there are other ways in which fascism is really not a, a coherent ideology uh, in the way that the the left speaks as if it is when they paint everybody on the far right with the broad brushstroke of fascism. So you were discussing it in terms of uh, the relationship between corporate and state power. If you actually look at Mussolini's Italy or if you look at National Socialist Germany, just in terms of the question of the relationship between the state and business, there was a a... a dichotomy between people who I think somewhat sincerely wanted to subsume corporate power under the state in order to protect the national interest, right? So that we don't have, for example, the kinds of uh, um, corporate treason that we see in the United States today, where all of our industrial secrets are immediately being given to foreign nations, or there are deals being made with China and other countries that uh, significantly undercut the American worker. There were people who wanted to bring, let's say, German corporations uh, into a kind of working relationship with the German state that would benefit the German citizen on the one hand. Uh, and so you, in a way, you could consider those people more socialistic. And the most extreme form of them were the Strasserites who actually attempted a coup against Hitler. Then you have, on the other hand, really cynical uh, German big businessmen and their counterparts in Italy who saw this in terms of corporations taking over the state, which is more what we have in the United States now, right? So you have that dichotomy within so-called fascism. Then there's another dichotomy, which I've discussed um, uh, in my work, that's even deeper. And it, it shows you how really it's nonsensical to to talk about fascism as any kind of a coherent phenomenon. That's the dichotomy between the traditionalists and the futurists. So you have people who identified as fascist or national socialist who, who saw that ideology as a vehicle for creating a racially hierarchical caste society. Their ideal was something like classical Hindu India. And they saw the SS as something like a kshatriya caste serving these enlightened Brahmin. And uh, so they were gonna have a vertically uh, organized society based on um, a conception of eternal truth where their project was to bring the microcosm of their society into alignment with some putative cosmic order. And they saw themselves as the guardians of that cosmic order. You had those fascists. And, Savitri Devi, in the decades after uh, the Second World War, epitomizes that current of, of fascism. Julius Evola, his writings also, I think, 
really exemplify that current of so-called fascism. Then on the other side, you had F.T. Marinetti, one of the enthusiastic early collaborators with Benito Mussolini, F.T. Marinetti and the Italian futurists who were 180 degrees opposite to that in terms of their orientation. They were extremely progressive, uh, future-oriented, um, radically opposed to the worship of the past to the extent that someone like Marinetti said, look, as long as we worship these Roman sculptures and you know Florentine sculptures in the Uffizi Museum, Italy will never be a great nation again. So we need to go in and smash all these sculptures that are idols of the past. And you know, uh, we need to, uh, Italian power needs to be reborn in an entirely new form, right? Well, I mean, these are the, the two most opposed tendencies you could possibly imagine. And both of them uh, are identifiable in this so-called phenomenon of fascism. And it's the dialectical tension between them that made this such a powerful phenomenon in the 20th century. So bottom line, I would, I would say that um, it's really doing a disservice to any kind of incisive political analysis to even talk about fascism. We need to identify you know, what specific tendencies and trajectories and, and uh, motivations are at work um, in the current political landscape. And so how do you analyze the new world order as I would, as I was, as I would call it, you know, branded basically that's being rolled out, especially, I mean, look, it's, we've always, I've always, let's say we've always known that um, the heart of the influence in American politics that was new world order oriented came out of England the UK right because essentially with the British Empire which is not dead still exists the Queen is still the head of Australia and Canada and when the you but when the British Empire was re dealing with the loss of colonies and the, the inevitable loss of territory like India for example and they knew knew that their manpower was not strong enough I mean in fact even when it was at its height it was a lot of the men were under arms of the British East India Corporation, which is, there you go, a perfect example of fascism, marriage of corporation and state, right, to, um, to impose, to impose uh, your will on other countries, largely for extraction of resources, right? That's really what the empire was about. Uh, they all say they built roads and rail, but let's be honest, the rail was built from the mines to the coast. <laughs> it was a very clear extraction operation. It was not there to designed to uplift, um, you know, with technology, the, the poor, you know, blacks of the earth or uh, Indians or whatnot. So the point is that uh, when the in British Empire was coming to an end, it saw, it saw America being reincorporated as a necessity to maintain itself, and it wanted to rebrand itself as the Commonwealth and this notion that, you know, we are basically here with the based on the vestiges of, of the best of the British, which is our law, you know, our law and order and our... Um, yeah, basically our legal principles and, um, you know, some of our technologies and things like this, our maritime empire. So let's build a, a new order. And it's basically been chugging along, you know, really in the post-war era. It was, you know, Brit Britain, America, the special relationship. This whole thing was very strong. And all of a sudden, Trump comes in in 2016, and the British hated him, hated him. I mean, literally, look at the Steele dossier. It was That's just an indica small indication, right, of, of MI6 trying to... To, to throw some you know monkey uh, wrenches monkey wrenches into the the mix but overall it was it was clear that the British especially you know those uh, that were seeking for this global order see this man who's coming out and saying you know we're not going to join the Paris Accords we're not going to you know we don't like uh, the fact that we're paying too much for NATO we don't like NAFTA we don't like the TP we're cutting out of the TPP um, we want to bring our supply chain home we want to challenge China all these things that are nationalistic, right? That of course, you know, they are labeled, you know, he must be a Nazi or something because no one is a nationalist since the Nazis apparently. Uh, but he was nationalistic in his approach. So, you know, of course the New World Order Republicans didn't like him, you know, the Romneys and the Cheneys and people like this, right? Um, and then, you know, obviously the Clintons and others, you know, who control the Democrat Party, right, were against him. So he comes into power. We see this coup essentially from day one two impeachments two faulty impeachments really uh nothing comes of it you know the rig the election you know 
<laughs> I think it's pretty evident to anyone with two eyes who could see what happened. So they bring in this guy, Biden, who's a complete puppet, not even a functional human, really. I mean, look at, you know, you look at his his speeches. It's obvious that he's being cued. He's probably got earpieces. He's he's also uh, a racist, being, by the way. He's a racist. Absolutely. He actually I, is a racist. He Trump is. wasn't. A, go look up that uh, the roaches uh, video, you know, where Biden is talking about little black kids as roaches. Oh, um, sure. The oh, guy yeah. is anyway. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. No, he thinks of poor, you know, he he's he is what was Senator Byrd, Robert Robert Byrd, the KKK, uh, what was he, Grand Wizard, I think at one point. He was like his mentor. Um, Biden is brought in and as we saw, bumbling out of, you know, from the basement, can't, you know, very incoherent, having to literally come in with this masked presidency where, you know, he's reading from a teleprompter and saying to people, yeah, they told me to do this. They told me to do that. I mean, it's just it's 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 abominable stuff, laughable. It's almost a farce, you know, to the American public to see this guy. Um, and yet it really does feel like this is the, the New World Order's strongest push now. Right. Using scientism, scientific dictatorship, scientific materialism um, to basically enforce this. And we look at places that are part of the British Empire. Canada, Australia, as being epitomes, let's say epitomizing what the New World Order would look like where, you know, people are not able to go outside even without masks on in Australia. Uh, they are trying to, you know, basically force vaccinate the entire population of Australia, Canada, um, mandates across the board in the UK now for any kind of indoor gatherings, I don't know, pubs or whatnot entertainment venues so it's clear what the agenda is how do you see it playing out here in the u.s because it's a different country it's a different texture the people have different principles so before i can answer that question i think uh i need to back up a bit and address the beginning of what you were laying out there namely this definition of the new world order and exactly who it is that's pushing this new world order I agree with Carol Quigley's analysis that, as you suggested, there's an Anglo-American establishment which wanted to uh, bring the seceded colonies back into the fold of the British Empire in a new form, right? And they did that unofficially. Beginning certainly around 1900, uh, they, they um, you know, brought the United States back under the control of uh, the economic and intelligence uh, apparatus of the British Empire. But I would extend that to include Germany. It's not simply Anglo-American. It's some kind of Anglo-Saxon world order that includes Germany. And if you actually go back and look at the business and, and political connections uh, among the American, the British, and the German elites, beginning in the 1890s and extending until the 1940s, you come to the conclusion, as I've argued in, in both my book, Prometheism, and in the latest uh, um, uh, work I've written on Closer Encounters, you come to the conclusion that Nazi Germany was set up by Anglo-Americans. The Anglo-American elite created a Frankenstein's laboratory in the heart of Europe, which we call Nazi Germany. And when they were done using it, they harvested it's genius. All of the top people, many of whom were far worse, quote unquote, war criminals than those prosecuted at Nuremberg, were brought over here under Operation Paperclip and naturalized as US citizens and became the bedrock of the so-called military industrial complex. So, and, and also the OSS was fused with a Nazi East European spy network called the Galen Organization in order to create the CIA. The CIA, at its foundation was co-constituted uh, through a fusion of the OSS and the Galen organization in Eastern Europe, because the Nazis already had this vast spy network uh, that wound up behind uh, you know, Soviet communist lines. And so it was very convenient to just use those people. In any case, um, when you look at how JP Morgan and John Rockefeller and Alan Dulles in the 1920s, we're funding the rise of Italian fascism 
and national socialism in Germany. And then you see uh, how Ford is still building tanks for Hitler as the war's begun and how IBM is you know, uh, providing all of their state-of-the-art technology to the Germans to use, for example, uh, on the punch card system uh, of the concentration camps, right? You get the picture that this is a vast uh, international network that extends from uh, California, where you had Prussians working on advanced airship technology as early as the 1890s, all the way to uh, you know, uh, greater Germany in, in the heart of Europe. And so then, you know, uh, I think it's important to also look at who the first three people are to prominently use the term new world order in public discourse. H.G. Wells, who came out with a book called The New World Order. The title is literally The New World Order, um, which was like a nonfiction proposal for the kind of utopia that he had uh, fictionally uh, uh, imagined in um, The Shape of Things to Come. You know, the 19, I think it was 1933 book, The Shape of Things to Come, which was made into a big budget Hollywood movie, Things to Come. The nonfiction proposal for creating such a socialist global technocracy was put forth in the New World Order. Now, H.G. Wells was a British socialist. Who's the other person to use the phrase New World Order at the same time? Adolf Hitler, in a political speech, talks about the New World Order. And then we get, uh, round about the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, George H.W. Bush, about how you know the end of the Soviet Union was the inauguration of a New World Order. Well, how did we bring about the end of the Soviet Union? We imported all these Nazis. And I think actually they used us. They functioned as parasites within the American military, industrial, economic intelligence system to achieve the objective of the collapse of Soviet communism uh, and to replace it with a different kind of socialism slash fascism uh, that ultimately aimed at bringing about this so-called new world order. Um, but here's the important point that I'm trying to make there is that if you see on the one end of the spectrum, H.G. Wells, and on the other end of the spectrum, Adolf Hitler, and maybe George H.W. Bush somewhere in between, although of course his father Prescott was funding the Nazis together with you know, Morgan and Rockefeller and so forth. This shows you again that fascism is not a coherent phenomenon, right? H.G. Wells, British socialist on the one hand, Adolf Hitler, you know, racist Nazi on the other hand, uh, clearly, there's some degree of, how can I put it, uh, complexity and internal variegation inside this structure. Well, I'll, I would suggest one thing. The reason you mentioned, you know, certainly uh, Pepperata's book on The Conjuring Hitler is one of the must-reads, I think, for any, anyone who wants to understand um, how Hitler was created with, as you mentioned, the Anglo-American the Anglo financing behind it. Um, some ideology, certainly the genetics stuff, eugenics stuff came out of our conferences. The British and the Americans were hosting the first eugenics conferences, right? This is before the Forget Nazi. hosting conferences. We had the most robust eugenics program in the world. The United States was the world's leader in eugenics from the 1890s onwards. And, you know, Hitler and his associates made it very clear that they were afraid Germany was falling behind American eugenics and they wanted to model their eugenics programs on ours. So yeah. absolutely, the whole eugenics project was an Anglo-American project to begin with. Exactly, so I think I would suggest that Hitler really just was the uh, egoic, he got a Napoleonic sort of complex, the way that you know some have argued that Napoleon at some levels was, was sort of created by the, sort of the financial and intelligence networks uh, that allowed him to come to power, but then you know Hitler essentially was, well he came to power and he basically says he's designed to go east, right? That's the design. That's why all these Brits, you know, basically keep ac acquiescing. They say they're appeasing him. Well, no, he's his his designation was to go attack Russia to keep them basically to keep these two powers fighting very much as we saw with the Iran Iraq War, right? Bleed each other to death. We want to see a constant bleeding of people, manpower, money. But when Hitler decides, well, wait a minute, I got all these weapons, I could actually uh, 
subjugate England, right? Or I could actually make, you know, bring bring England into alliance with me because these guys are sniping at my heels and that, you know, I know that they're going to be fighting, let's say, even though I'm doing essentially what they want, he couldn't trust the Brits. He understood that, I think. So he go, he goes the other way and he wants to really, he wants to, he wants to make peace with England, but I think England was not ready to be in a, su- a submissive or subordinate position to Hitler, right? That was not their their design for him. So that's why essentially that the Hitler operation gets out of control, right? Well, especially once he once he takes over France, which isn't the end of the world for the British, but certainly once he starts attacking England, that's that's danger for them. When Rudolf Hess flew to Britain uh, in, a, in an unauthorized flight to bring a I think it was the third peace offer from Hitler to the British, not just peace, but an offer of collaboration. The Germans were actually volunteering to fight alongside the British Navy to protect their mutual interests across the world. And Hess was flying into Britain to bring, I think, at least the third peace offer from Hitler. Uh, Hess had the contact information for 30 of the highest ranking members of the British parliament who were sympathetic to Nazi Germany. Well, look, I mean, Hess may have been arrested under the orders of uh, Winston Churchill and you know, put away for the rest of his life so that he couldn't talk about these things. But what about those 30 members of the British parliament that he was supposed to contact, right? I mean, these people were still at the core of the British establishment for decades thereafter. So again, it highlights the fact that we are dealing with a transcontinental system that goes from America to Britain to Germany. uh, And that, you know, this, the uh, policy group, the steering group for this new world order is a little bit more complex than a lot of uh, conspiracy theorists give it credit for. And I think that that's something that's important to understand in terms of devising strategy to uh, dismantle this thing and to, and to uh, overcome you know, the, uh, the machinations that they're unfolding um, in order to bring about some kind of oppressive global system. Because as soon as you understand that the people you're dealing with are not monolithic and that like any human organization, there's internal dissension. There's maybe in, in some cases, as I suggested earlier, in terms of the traditionalists and the futurists, there's a, a, uh, a polar opposition uh, between certain of the members of this organization. And so, you know, I think that it's possible perhaps to appeal to certain people even within uh, this power structure and to present them with, um, you know, a, a more inspiring alternative vision for development going forward. But it, it has to be pragmatic enough uh, and, and shrewd enough um, of an alternative uh, so that, you know, um, it's taken seriously by people who potentially are dissenters from within the steering group itself. But so, so finish the thought. How do you see the New World Order now playing out in the U.S.? So the reason I thought that that was an important um, setup for answering that question is because I think it'll come down to whether this steering group remains a cohesive block or whether serious dissension from within the ranks uh, takes place. We have a large constellation of states within this country who are either uh, conservative Republican or libertarian Republican. You know, the the, the old South, Dixie, uh, and then the West, which is more libertarian, right? And if the United States breaks up in a way that results in some kind of an evangelical theocracy in the South, in a kind of, uh, you know, a neo-confederacy that's quasi-theocratic, what, you know, a lot of these uh, conservatives in the Bible Belt call a biblical republic, right? That uh, fragment of the former United States will play right into the hands of the people who want to bring about this global system of oppression. They want that kind of a breakup of America because they can then use that theocracy in the South in a dialectical fashion to push things in the direction they want. Whereas if the United States breaks apart in a way where we have 
a, a much larger red state entity that's more libertarian leaning and where you know there's an emphasis on individual uh, rights and personal liberty and really we open up again you know a free space for creative enterprise and innovation in the west right minus the west coast <laughs> in the, sorry <laughs> And the, look, New York is, is screwed too. So, you know, we're, we're both in really bad shape. We're probably both going to have to relocate at some point. Hey, hey I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm heading to Florida, man. <laughs> yeah. So as long as the people in Tallahassee don't wind up determining, uh, you know, the, the shape of this red state entity, and instead of evangelical Christians, we have, you know, libertarian minded, you know, frontiers, neo frontiersmen, uh, defining the identity of this largest piece of the former United States, then I think we have considerable possibilities for re resistance. But practically speaking, whether or not that happens, I think really does depend on whether certain individuals and uh, organizations that are part of this steering group can be prevailed upon to use the resources of America in a more constructive fashion um, than others of them are planning to, right? I, you know, there's a lot of potential in this country, still more potential, raw potential than in any other place in the world. And I think certain individuals might be able to be prevailed upon uh, to uh, to define what replaces the United States in terms of more libertarian, more uh, you know, industrious and uh, innovative ideals and uh, not allow it to become some kind of a, a reactionary biblical republic or, or American theocracy. I think that's key because a libertarian United States that reclaims the uh, Promethean spirit that was at the foundation of uh, you know, revolutionary America, that entity could not only reconquer the uh, blue states, that entity could ultimately be a standard bearer for liberation on the entire planet. So you're, worried, you're saying you're essentially worried about this evangelical aspect, which certainly the, the mainstream media touts as sort of the danger of the, you know, the evangelical movement. Do you, you see that as a concern? Yes, I do. And I think that, uh, you know, some of the people, look, just in the same way as they used rabid racists in 1930s uh, Germany in order to accomplish their agenda, I think that there is also a plan to use virulent um, evangelical fundamentalism in the American South in order to dialectically accomplish their agenda. Uh, what these Southern um, uh, advocates of a biblical republic don't understand is that they are going to just be put through the meat grinder. They're going to be used in order to bring about a certain state of affairs um, where uh, they are ultimately defined as a regressive enemy of the new world order and ultimately crushed. So, you know, the, the same forces, corporate forces and so forth, uh, that facilitate their establishment of a neo confederacy in a the theocratic form are ultimately going to turn on them and basically annihilate them in a in a uh, replay of the the American Civil War. You know, where we had General Sherman come down and basically Holocaust the population of Atlanta. It's going to look worse this time. So we can't allow the breakup of the United States to go in that direction. And you know, we have to convince people in uh, the red states that it's, it's the libertarian uh, elements of the American political heritage that really need to be emphasized. Hey, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't feel a concern that actually uh, from the evangelical concept prospect because I do believe that there's what's playing out, I feel, is this, this I call it ma ma satanic materialism. Right. It fundamentally, it's a satanic force at work here that believes wholeheartedly in material reality, doesn't understand the spirit of uh, the spirit or the spark of spirit that gives life to this world, 
uh, wants to basically put everything into a compliance to the, a, a falsified science, which is again technocracy controlled. Uh, you know, going back to the nature of, let's say, you know, Darwinian notions of science that are curated, and you can't, you know, you cannot debate it. If you try to debate it, you are ex excommunicated from the scientific community. That's not science. That's theology. That's theocracy. So actually, they're the role. The ones who are pushing the scientific dictatorship are playing out a theocratic movement in the name of science. Um, and then there are those who actually, I would say, are there those who are, you know, the the evangelicals who are extreme yeah but i don't see it as much as far as the the real th any kind of real threat people who are under threat are looking to leadership and guidance but i do believe that the faith factor is an important thing that you can't quantify you know you can't quantify and you can't qualify it because it's true faith that does give us life on this earth that we are connected to a spirit and a, and a, and a, and a source of creation that uh, we intuitively and innately know about in our, in our, let's say we intuitively know in our, in our soul. So it's like they may, again, I don't see that, I don't think that's their agenda right now. Their agenda right now is to roll out and enforce this new world order as dramatically and, and insistently as, and incessantly as possible. But uh, in terms of trying to at the same time foment a counter, that might be a narrative that they push, but I just don't see it having traveled the country um, connecting to people of faith, just because one is of faith doesn't mean that they're here with an evangelical, apocalyptic psychology that this is uh, this is all gonna have to be you know be burned down or destroyed or to bring the, you know the rapture. I don't feel that and don't see that, and I I see a lot of alliances across all different colors and people coming here you know from all different races and backgrounds and seeing that there is a a tremendously progressive movement in a sense taking place in the red states that are traditionally you know vilified because we've actually not been able to get to know them because the media has so often colored the perspective whether it's movies media has so colored the conception that we have of what it is to be conservative right it is it is uh, it's a false brand in a sense right and then you go to then you start to like travel to the to the regions and you know yes i mean are there the backwaters and the places that you know the, the psychologies that are really backwards sure but you know what there's also the karens and the in the cities that are completely terrifying and completely brainwashed so you know you get those that percentage of the population that's brainwashed on all sides overall i guess i just don't feel that the the the, the movement against this totalitarian scientific dictatorship is coming from a evangelical place but actually coming from a lot of reason and rationality and faith in spirit that basically we you know there is something that's transcendent but we're not coming at it from a religious perspective we're coming at it from the faith of you know hey we've survived uh germs and, and illness and and germs and disease for millennia you know that's this is what they what they keep forgetting it's like you know you're talking about humans that have been resilient and, and able to survive you know any number of of germs if disease theory was real Right. If, if it was this germ theory of disease was real, we would all be dead by now. Right. It doesn't it doesn't work, germ theory, because we literally encounter innumerable and incalculable amounts of germs, of, of, of viruses, of bacteria. Right. In, in, and we have them in our bodies. So the idea of this sort of like this magical germ, you know, the covid, that's why they have to keep putting out now the variant and the variant. But it's like their game it's like it's revealing itself so rapidly because they're forcing mandates they're trying to force you to do something but then every where you look people that are vaccinated are getting sick and then there's got they have new variants that are coming out that are basically saying well that's you know the, the vaccine won't even help so we need to get you boosters i mean it's like your game is up it's just a con at this point and i think people get that i think people are much more rational than than we give them credit for yeah, I mean, uh, in no way was I suggesting that the um, the uh, technocratic totalitarians uh, somehow, you know, believe in evangelical Christianity. My point was that these people are masters of psychological warfare and social engineering, and they can take virulent ideologies and use them in a dialectical fashion. Uh, them to one another in certain ways in order to accomplish an end 
that remains um, occluded from those who are being manipulated. And uh, the thing I would, I would uh, where, where I would push back um, is to say that I see the evangelical Christianity of the mega churches in the South as a form of religious materialism. I think uh, the Buddhist uh, writer Chogyam uh, Tr Trungpa uh, used this phrase, religious materialism. And I mean, there are forms of religiosity that are very materialistic, as materialistic as scientism. Uh, whereas, you know, the, the great achievement of America, I think, more than its, its industry, its, its uh, technical innovation, the great achievement of America um, is its bold spiritual imagination. When you, when you read people like Emerson and Thoreau and William James, uh, you know, e even all the way up to people like Philip K. Dick, I mean, this country, the religious freedom that was constitutionally integral to this country allowed for this tremendous blossoming of uh, real religious diversity and the exploration of the human spirit by the sovereign individual. And I think that we need to make sure that if the United States falls apart and there's this large red state entity, uh, that the libertarian aspects of the American heritage are emphasized so that that project of um, you know, spiritual evolution and uh, you know, religious exploration on the part of the individual is allowed to continue. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely, absolutely. And in, in contrast to that, you have the Taliban. I want to bring up just you know, in the end here, the um, Taliban movement, which I think shocked a lot of people at how strong they still are 20 years after the U.S. invasion, right? And people are, we're sitting here scratching our heads going, well, you know, wasn't the whole part of the whole mission was to sort of uh, empower the Northern Alliance and the other tribes and whatnot. Um, so before getting into like who the Pashtun really are and, and what's behind it, just uh, in origin, let's just talk about the Taliban. Are they still very much back from Pakistan and what was what was considered I know back in the, the 2001 time period is sort of a creation of the uh, the Pakistani intelligence services I mean is that who you see them as an extension of and and how they've been able to sort of maintain this this not just maintain to really just take take the country back with, with ease as soon as uh, the US left in an abominable way of leaving weapons and bases intact and civilians behind but um, how do you how do you see the Afghan uh, the the Taliban situation in terms of how they've been able to stay in power. You mentioned the Northern Alliance, right? So no, it was never our objective to help the Northern Alliance. The CIA killed Ahmad Shah Massoud. They made sure to get him before 9-11 happened, right? Because Ahmad Shah Massoud was a tremendously charismatic, you know, Tajik Persian uh, leader who could actually have you know, continued the resistance against the Taliban and ultimately prevailed in uh, you know, establishing a form of government in Afghanistan that would be true to the country's heritage, right? As part of the Iranian civilizational sphere. And so I think the, the CIA got rid of him uh, in anticipation of you know, what they were going to do um, and what in fact they have done now over the past 20 years in Afghanistan. The, the thing about the Taliban is this, okay, Taliban ultimately means religious student, right? And so these Talibs who were involved in the Afghan civil war uh, in the time when the Soviet Union came in in 1978, 79, right? You had already these Talibs, these devout religious students who formed mercenary organizations, but that's not today's Taliban. Today's Taliban was created by the CIA setting up an organization in Pakistan called Al Qaeda, the base, the base of operations from which they recruited Saudis and other Salafis and Wahhabis to come to Afghanistan, southern Afghanistan in particular, through Pakistan, through Waziristan. And it's these imported Arab and other Sunni and Salafi mercenaries 
who took the existing Talibs and put them on steroids and created this Taliban that we see today. So the reason that this Taliban was able to march you know, uh, with impunity across the country is because it is an organization that uh, you know, was basically dramatically enhanced and augmented by Saudi uh, and other you know, um, uh, economic and, and, and military uh, power, right? I mean, we've been funding and arming these people indirectly through Pakistan and Saudi Arabia for 30 years, at least. Uh, whereas, for example, during the Iran-Iraq war, at the tail end of the Iran-Iraq war, the Islamic Republic of Iran was backing Ahmad Shah Massoud in the Northern Alliance. So it, you know, anyone who thinks that the United States ever had the intention of ultimately like supporting forces of, of uh, progress and, uh, I don't know, humanitarianism in Afghanistan is totally deluded. From day one, when, you know, under Carter, we went in there and tried to, uh, you know, push the Soviets out of Afghanistan, we were supporting the most virulently fundamentalist Islamic forces in the country. Yes. Um, the end result of which, you know, was the enslavement of half of the population, the women of Afghanistan, and the demolition of the Bamiyan Buddhas. Yes. And, you know, I'll never forget that day. It was one of the most traumatic things I've ever seen in my life when I watched those Buddhas be demolished. And the idea that we now have an administration calling the people who demolished the Bamiyan Buddhas, quote, our Afghan partners, unquote, just makes me incensed. Yes. Yes. I mean, there's, a, there's gotta be a line somewhere. They, they really have crossed the line. A, a United States that considers the Taliban, quote, its Afghan partners, unquote, against who? Against Al-Qaeda, the organization you created in Pakistan? Against what, Islamic State? An organization you created by deposing, look, I, look I'm no friend of Saddam Hussein. The fact of the matter is that the United States created the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria yes. by deposing the government of Saddam Hussein and destabilizing Assad Syria. And, I, well, and Libya. Know, is the creation of the United States as well. So you're telling me that- And Libya was, Libya was another- Two Islamic terrorist organizations that you created, we now have to consider the Taliban that enslaved women and blew up the Bamiyan Buddhas as our Afghan partners, unquote. And you're gonna take 85, trillion, uh, 80, sorry, $85 billion of American taxpayer money to give these people the state of the art, you know, attack helicopters and tanks and machine guns and so on and so forth. I mean, this is just an outrage. So what do you think it is as far as the invasion of 2002 time period? Uh, I remember in that time period, Unicall was trying to get pipelines through Afghanistan. There was talk that, you know, this was about pipelines, uh, oil, you know, natural gas pipelines. And then um, there was also talk, uh, certainly it wasn't just talk, I know military guys that were guarding opium fields, poppy fields, right, in Afghanistan, and certainly the opioid epidemic, you would have to think, had some connection to the uh, U.S. getting control of the poppy fields because the Taliban at the time had basically uh, stopped production, or, uh, or if they hadn't stopped it, essentially, if they had re outsourced it to someone else, let's say, um, the point is the U.S. wanted to get a hold of that. So why would we give up Afghanistan, what was the motivation to uh, withdraw at this point? The same elites who are behind the military industrial complex in the United States on a financial level and who involved us in that region in the first place, right, have now decided to shift the balance of power to China. You can see this on every level from Silicon Valley, you know, to uh, you know, um, how the response to COVID is being managed. You can see that the elites in this country uh, really have committed treason against the American people and have decided to concede American power um, and to basically, uh, you know, facilitate the rise of China as, uh, you know, the dominant, the dominant uh, superpower of the planet. And so I think that basically, uh, you know, control of Afghanistan and of the international, uh, you know, the, the aspect of the international drug trade that's run from out of there is being handed over to the Chinese. Uh, and it's, 
you know, it doesn't make any difference to the elites because they're already, look, the, the research at Wuhan that created COVID-19 was funded by these same elites based in our country. And so it doesn't make a difference to them, whether it's the Chinese who now, you know, are the boots on the ground in Afghanistan or whether, you know, they, they use the American military to do their bidding. Uh, so, so yeah, I think basically a transfer of power is, take, is taking place and you're going to see, you know, the Chinese, um, you know, manage Afghanistan, but still to the benefit of the same global elite. Exactly, exactly. I mean, that's essentially the shift that we've seen when George Soros says uh, China is the great model of how to run the new world order. I mean, I'm paraphrasing it, but essentially he was saying, you know, we should look to, to China and how they rule um, they run things, but even China is not necessarily always in their graces. Um, I don't know that they necessarily have the control over China that they imagine they do. I mean, certainly if, if you look at the strategy, you talk about the elites, think about the Rockefeller in, in uh, the Rockefeller initiative to open China, right? That was very clear um, in terms of the seven, early 70s and, sh- and starting to outsource our, our, our work, you know, let's say our, our manufacturing a- abroad from that same time period, right? And move, you know, move our, um, how do you say, start to basically put America into greater debt. Then as we saw who bought that debt, you know, over time, the Chinese came in and became major buyers of America, American debt. Um, but how, you know, as far as the, 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 the hooks that they have into China, how do you see that as far as I know the British certainly had a lot of influence in China since the days of the opium wars, right? But never fully controlled it. I mean, they got Hong Kong and that's where they set up the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, which was very much involved with the drug traffic, right? From the, the opium wars, um, and laundering of money thereafter. Um, and certainly the Sung the Sung sisters, right, and the relationship of finance uh, in the in the early days of Ch- uh, the pre Mao China, right? There was uh, the British were all over that, but once Mao came to power, um, and the sort of you know the, the rise of the CP, how do you see the elites? How much how much control or power and influence do you think that the elites have when it comes to China and the the CP era? It's a good question because. I mean, look at what happened with Nazi Germany. As you suggested earlier, you know, I'm not sure that that played out exactly as they had intended, right? I mean, they had certain ideas for how they were going to use the, the machinery of Nazi Germany, and then, you know, Hitler had his own ideas. Uh, so it's possible that the Chinese will make certain moves once once they, you know, are, you know, sufficiently enriched and empowered by this plan to, you know, uh, b- basically endorse their consolidation of power globally, they may actually get some own ideas into their head about how they want to use that power that are at odds with the global elite. That's entirely possible. The reason I think that this elite has opted for China, though, has to do with uh, what kind of ideology and model for social, social organization you get when you fuse Confucianism with Maoism. You know, each of these is a very collectivistic, paternalistic ideology. And when you marry the two of them, you get the ultimate model for the, the uh, basically total disempowerment of the individual and the subsumption of the individual underneath a, uh, a, a, an organic state and um, you know, in service to a, a, a hive-minded technocracy. Uh, that functions like a well-oiled machine to enrich and empower the elites uh, who run it. And so, you know, in uh, this hybrid Confucianist Maoist China, we see, I think, the antithesis of the value of the human individual that was at the wellspring of the American Revolution, right? I mean, these are the two most opposed political models that you could imagine. And um, so I think that's why, you know, uh, the Chinese are, are, are being invested in. And, you know, I, I think it's important to consider radical possibilities of what could happen in China to destabilize that plan. In particular, um, the potential of Tibetan Buddhism to revolutionize the situation in China. 
uh, you know, freeing Tibet, which is something I've, I've thought a lot about. I haven't written about it, haven't spoken much about it, but freeing Tibet in, in, in some way to become an autonom autonomous nation is in some way, of course, desirable and, and a laudable aim. But imagine what could happen instead if Tibet were to remain a part of China and become the, uh, the cradle for a spiritual revolution that transforms Chinese society as a whole, right? I mean, Im imagine a day when renegade Tibetan lamas are preaching in Beijing and Shanghai uh, and what that could do for the world. Because of course, you know, the Mongolians are also part of this Chinese empire, right? And the Mongolians are also Vajrayana Buddhists. So there are uh, potential um, bastions of resistance from within the Chinese structure itself. And I think that that's an angle of approach that, you know, we should consider very seriously.